minutes come through, okay. I just realised I've got a really noisy bracelet on, so I've just taken it off. All right, so we're live in the group now. Um, thanks everyone who's watching today, or I know a lot of people watch it later on recording, so thanks to those who do that. Um, just want to introduce everyone to Susan Johnson. So um, Susan has been writing books since her first novel, Messages from Chaos, which was published in 1987. She has worked as a journalist for publications including The Courier Mail, The Australian Women's Weekly, The Sun Herald, The Sydney Morning Herald and The National Times. So I think, yeah, a great um, wide variety and you certainly have been writing for a while. She's written 10 novels and two non-fiction books and um, she's a recipient of several grants from the Literature Board of the Australian Council and was awarded the Nancy Keesing Fellowship at the C City International Des Arts of Paris. So her latest novel is From Where I Fell and I have just finished reading it and really, really loved the format of how it was written, the structure of how it was written. Um, I haven't come across a book like that before. And um, just want to let everyone know that thanks to Alan and Unwin, we have some copies of From Where I Fell um, to give away to people who ask a question during the Facebook Live. So please type your questions and comments. So thanks so much for Susan joining us. Um, is there something you'd like to tell us more about yourself or more about your latest book? Well, thank you so much for asking me, Jackie. Um, firstly, it's great that I'm actually back in Australia because I've been one of the stranded Australians. Oh, wow. Well, um, yeah, whereabouts yeah. So, were you? Well, I was in Greece. Um, my mum and I took off at the beginning of 2019 and my mum, Barbara, is 85 well she was 85 years old when we left and we took off to sort of live this this life in Greece for a year or two but um, mum found it pretty hard so she came back at the end of 2019 little okay. did we know what was about to hit the whole world mm. um, so she was so lucky because we started to hear the stories of COVID yeah. at the end of that year and then by sort of beginning of last year it was still okay where I was. I was on a very small island called Kithra, which is where a lot of Greek Australians come from. Okay. Um, it's between Crete and the Peloponnese. And um, there wasn't any COVID there. So I went to the UK to do some research on the book I was writing, which is a memoir of going to Greece with mm. mum. And I got stuck in London for four and a half months. Mm. Um, couldn't get back to, to, uh, to, to Greece to pick up my stuff. And then basically uh, it's taken me six months to get back oh, to Australia. Wow. Well, I'm glad, so you're, I'm I'm glad you're back safely. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm. Yeah, it must have been a bit of an experience. Oh, it really was. I had three cancelled flights. Um, and of course, then you got the quarantine to pay at the end of it. Mm. So I quarantined in Sydney. Um, you know, look, I know that there's a lot of um, ill feeling really towards um, people who are coming, who are, who are overseas and coming back. And why didn't they come back when, when um, the Prime Minister asked them to come back last March? But everyone's got complicated stories. I mean, I've got two, two kids living in London and mm. one of my younger boys has got a, a friend who's been trying to get back for months. He's got no money. He can't afford a business class ticket. I mean, I had to raid my super to do it. Mm. So I would just say there's 30,000 Australians. We're all Australians. We're all citizens. It's outrageous that the people aren't allowed to come back, really. We've yeah. got to work out some sort of safe way for them to come back. Look, I'm all for keeping Australians safe. Mm. I really am. And I think that Australia's done an amazing job. But we've got to work out a way to bring Australians back to the country. Yeah. As well. yeah. yeah. Anyway, so you'll see that part of the book is, a, is set in Greece. Mm. Um, but it's not set in the part that I was in. Okay. Yeah. So would you like to tell people watching a little bit about your book? Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually, it starts off, the whole premise is, is because this woman who's going through a bit of a crisis in her life, 
she's um, a single parent with three boys living in Sydney and her husband, ex-husband is living in, in France. So she, and he won't speak to her. So mm -hmm. essentially she's a really single mother because, you know, the father's absolutely not in the picture. Um, and so she, she sends off an email to him, but she doesn't know that, well, she does know that he's changed his emails. He, he's changed his email server, but she sends one to his old email address and one with the same format to what she thinks is his new email address. But it lands up, it lands in the off in the inbox of someone completely different, someone in Schenectady in upstate New York. And so she's called Chris. She's a Greek American, and she is interested in in Pamela's story for a whole number of reasons. One, she's a bit of a rescuer. So Pamela's obviously a person in crisis, and and Chris is a bit of a rescuer. And also, she kind of feels in some ways that, that um, you know, what she's kind of a busybody in some ways. What What's Chris's ex-husband doing in, in Paris? Um, why, you know, what what's her story? And so they're, they're connected right from the beginning. Uh, they've got a reason to keep emailing. And Chris, um, Chris is a sort of a voice of sanity, really, for Pamela, I think, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but I guess that the main thing to say is it, it, the whole book is written in emails. Yeah. but you'll know that the publishers hasn't actually haven't actually said anything about the book being in emails because they think it's going to put all readers off. Oh really? <laughs> okay. Did it put you off? No, I actually enjoyed it because it made it a lot easier to read. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So so the the sort of short emails i mean not all the emails are short yeah there's a big some are some are a bit longer and some are short and yeah no i found it um more of an easy reading because of that oh that's really interesting so i didn't put mm. you like it didn't put you off in terms of uh, reading like a novel no totally not at all no oh that's that's really interesting yeah. i mean i had to work really hard in a way to make it because emails are just sort of dashed off and, and they're colloquial and, you know, people just, they're not really um, considered pieces of writing, not even like writing a letter, which yeah. people put more thought into. So it was actually quite hard as a writer, I mean, if, if in the work of the writer, in, in crafting something that was compelling enough to read as a narrative, you know, because... And many times I got bogged down. And let me tell you, this book has taken years to write it's gone through about four or five drafts oh okay probably, yeah which is much more than most of my other books yeah wow well, that's quite a bit isn't it yeah 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 and i think i read some did you have similar experience of sending an email away yourself and not being the correct address yeah yeah i mean that's yeah. how the, one of, that's how the idea came to me because I sent this email to this publishing friend of mine who's, who's in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, mm. in America, and we were just talking about writer stuff, like people we know in common, um, her job, um, what was happening with, with the book, um, and she had changed her email server, and so it went to a completely random guy in San Jose in California. Mm. Now, I don't even know where San Jose is. <laughs> The only thing I know about San Jose is that um, Bert Bacharach song, you know, that years ago, you do you know the way to San Jose? Oh. So, so we kind of cracked a few jokes about that. But the, the thing is, of all the people that could have landed, you know, in, in his inbox, of all the people in the world, he's actually, he was actually an English teacher and he was actually wanting to write a novel. So we started corresponding oh. about... You know, like he, he asked me all these questions. Oh, how did you get an agent? Where, how old were you when you got published? All that kind of stuff. And so we started chatting originally about, about writing. And then we started talking more about our lives. And in fact, we're still in contact now, like 10 years later. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he's, <laughs> That's he's a pretty amazing moved. story. Yeah. 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 Um, and he's, I mean, he, he's married and everything. So there's no sort of creepy online <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he he was actually he's, he wanted to write and now he's he's he and his wife have retired to Mexico mm. and now he is finally writing his novel. Okay, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a pretty good story yeah. behind yeah. it. Yeah, um, we've got quite a few people watching, which is great. Um, got some questions coming through, so I'll read out some questions for you. 
Um, Mary wonders how long you've been writing for. Okay, well, um, I, I'm uh, afraid to say I've been writing for almost over 30 years and mm. I can't tell you if I had a dollar for everybody who asked me, how come I've never heard, heard of you or read <laughs> any of your books? Mm. It's, I don't know. I mean, my first book was in 1987 and I've written lots of books since then. Um, probably the novel you, some readers have, have heard of most was a book I wrote in 2005 called The Broken Book which was inspired by the life of Charmian Clift. Um, George Johnson was her husband who wrote My Brother Jack. And Charmian Clift, if no one has, has read her, you should rush out and, and read her. She's a, a most exquisite mm -hmm. writer. Mm -hmm. um, Peel Me a Lotus, a whole lot of um, non-fiction books mainly, but she, she did write um, some fiction as well. But she was also based in Greece. And I've known Greece for a long time. Um, I went there the first time when I was 18. I'm not Greek, but I have a lot of Greek Australian friends. Okay. And um, Clift and George Johnson lived on the island of Idra uh, in, in, in Greece. And so that book of all my books is probably the one that's um, sold the most copies. Um, mm -hmm. It was longlisted for the Miles Franklin and shortlisted for all, all sorts of literary prizes. Um, but didn't win any of them. So maybe that's the difference why you don't know people because increasingly in this publishing world, it's really only prizes that, that bring attention to, to the work of writers. Mm. Um, but the other book that people know me for is a memoir I wrote when my two boys were small um, because I, 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 I suffered this very unusual birth trauma um, in first world countries. Mm. Um, it's called a fistula and there's a, a woman called um, Dr. Catherine Hamlin who died just recently who did wonderful work with Eastern African women of, of East Africa and it's a very common birth injury in the women of, of, of Africa but no no one practically has it in, in a country like Australia okay. or a first world country. Mm. So I wrote a memoir about that called A Better Woman and that came out about 2000. So the sad the sad answer is I've written lots of books and I've been writing for 30 mm. years. <laughs> and had you always thought you'd be a writer? Um, I used to write poetry when I was at school and mm. I always loved English and I've always loved reading and every writer starts off as a, as a reader. I mean, that's the first impulse um, to try and create that, that lovely feeling of entering a whole other world I mean there's the world that you see in front of you and then there's this whole other world that a book gives you which is a sort of an alternative universe mm. and from very early on um, my grandmother had a lot of um, Dickens and Jane Austen and those sorts of books when I was young and then my other grandmother had all the Reader's Digest condensed you know books so I ran I, 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 read, I read a lot of um, you know those kind of who wrote Taipan and those kind of, oh, um, yeah. you know, you know the, those ones in the like um, in Hong Kong and um, mm. those kind of books in the, I guess they were, they were mainly in the fifties. So I've always, I started off as a as a, a reader, um, but then I probably thought of writing after I became a journalist um, and went to university. I, I did university part time and I was an old, you know, old style cadet, which they don't have anymore, where you you, you go into journalism directly from school. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So I kind of did think pretty early on that I wanted to be a writer, but it took me until I was about 30. I'm pretty much self taught, really, okay. um, to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it took a really long time. I started off with short stories, but um, and and um, published in quite a few literary journals and things like that. But it took me. I think I was in my late twenties when I started to to try and um, learn how to write a novel. And I, I, I sat down for a whole year um, when in between work, like before I went to work and after work, and on weekends, and looked at the books I really loved. And saw and tried to analyze how they were done, really. Okay. Mm. Yeah. No, that's so I'm really very much self taught. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kate's wondering if you have a favorite and least favorite part of your writing process. Um, 
Look, I've got to say, all the publicity, I'm actually an introvert. So <laughs> even though I, I talk a lot and, I, and lots of my friends think I'm, you know, I, I'm sort of like um, uh, a fake extrovert. <laughs> so I, 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 like, this is probably the part that I find hardest. Yeah. And most of my friends say the same thing because writers are really used to being in a room alone mm. for mm. months and, you know, People find it really hard to do that. You know, all the like during COVID, for anybody who's in Melbourne or, um, you know, I know even in Sydney, you've had um, lots of lockdown periods where you yeah. can't go into your office. Mm. Well, for me, I'm 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 very happy to be alone for for long periods of time, and certainly the most exciting part is when you suddenly get this idea and you think, oh my god, this is just such a great mm. idea, and then you you know you write down a few things for it. And then there comes this awful moment a few weeks into the writing of something when you realise, I mean, you know, T.S. Eliot and all those people talked about, you know, the, the, the shadow that falls between the idea and its execution. Mm -hmm. I mean, like this one, I, I got the idea about the emails, but then when it actually came to doing it, it was so, so, so hard. But there is always a lovely moment when you're, right into a book when you're finally into it when it really is true that the, the characters take over and it writes itself yeah. i mean yeah. chris for example became such a oh she's so real to me in many ways i just think she's out there is, is, is mm. walking around mm. um and in fact there was a review that, that someone posted very kindly on um instagram she was saying she found both characters, Pamela, she's very, Pamela's very dramatic and kind of needy and a bit whiny. And a lot of people don't like Pamela. But she said she really didn't like Chris because she thought Chris was so rude and bossy. And But to me, yeah. she's, she, you know, she seems really real. Um, I think Pamela seems really real to me too. Um, you know, one of the questions that, that, that people often ask is how autobiographical is it? Mm. And... I mean, you know, look, I am a divorced mother. I've got two two sons. Yeah. Um, and, you know, while while the literal truth isn't my truth, I mean, I don't have an ex-husband in Paris who's not speaking to me. <laughs> Certainly the emotional truth was, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and, and so when I was interested in writing about divorce, you know, we, we think that divorce is just a real commonplace now that, it, you know, like we all know this, you know, one in three marriages ends in divorce, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But in fact, um, of the friends I know who've been divorced, you know, all of them say it's one of the most painful things that ever happened to them in their whole mm -hmm. life. You know, um, I don't know anybody who really, you know, feels completely, you know, kicking up your heels about divorce. Um, and it, it, it's a period that really arouses very strong emotions. So I was kind of interested in writing about that. So once I got into that part of the book, um, I kind of enjoyed Pamela's wallowing around, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people think she wallows too much, but... Um, mm -hmm. Pamela was very... She was very persistent as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Um, Anne Lee is wondering if you wrote the book when you were overseas. Ah, really good question. Well, I started writing this book probably, uh, maybe, it's hard to remember, probably about I got the idea maybe five or six years ago. And so I started writing parts of it then. But I, I've been, um, I actually have been a single mother, so I, I was... Um, uh, working and, and looking after the kids. So I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning before I started work mm -hmm. at, at eight, left for work at 8.30. So I would say that it's actually been taken, I did, I, I certainly wrote that in Australia and I had a complete full draft done, probably about third draft already when I moved to Greece. Okay. But when I moved to Greece, that was when the final draft was done. So mm -hmm. I spent the whole of 2009 before COVID, when everyone was coming to Greece to party and to go to Tavernas <laughs> and drink ouzo, yeah. I was stuck in my room like this, you know, and people would, would couldn't believe that I was actually working. And it's, you know, because before a book is out, and even when people know you're a writer, they it, it's kind of quite hard for them to 
put two and two together that it's only through work mm. um, and saying no to, you know, going out to dinners and lunches mm. that you get anything done. Mm. And how, like you said before, like it's in an email format and that, how hard or easy was that to sell to your publisher? Yeah, well, that's really an interesting question. Mm. Have you noticed, Jackie, that there's no mention on the cover or in the blurbs that this is that a novel in an emails? email format? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. because the publishers thought that it would really put readers off if, the, if, mm. if we, you know, said this was emails. But, you know, don't forget... Um, you know that, that, that movie with Meg Ryan, You've Got Mail? I mean, that came out in the 80s. Mm. It's not that, as if email hasn't been used in art before as an idea, not, not necessarily in books. I mean, I couldn't find any books. When I realised that that's what I was doing, I actually looked to see if I could find any books in emails. There are lots of books in letters. Okay, um, yeah. I don't know if you remember mm. that um, Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's masterpiece, I'd even forgotten this. Because you don't you don't even think of it as as a book as a book of letters, but that's completely in yeah, letters. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then another favourite book of mine, eighty four Charing Cross Road by Helen Ham, that was made into a movie too. That's also in letters. So I I knew that there there were novels in letters, which I'd also love. Mm -hmm. But as far as I knew, there weren't any in emails. But what I did was I didn't say anything to. I've got a a, a, a much loved um, publisher, Annette Barlow, who's been my publisher you know, for a long time now. Um, and she she didn't have any problems with it at all. Yeah. You know, she was, I'm, I must say, I'm very, very thankful for her support in it because, you know, it is a kind of weird book mm. in a lot of ways. Mm. And, yeah, I wonder if that will encourage other authors to write like that as well. Yeah, well, it's interesting, isn't mm. it? I mean, yeah. I guess you've got to have, the, like, the, you've got to have a reason, especially if they're, they're people who don't know each other. I mean, I think there's, you could probably have a whole series of, of letters between friends, say. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just reading about, um, did you read the Edward DeWall book that came out a couple of years ago um, called The Hair with the Amber Eyes? No. Um, it's a really beautiful book. He's a potter, but it's about, um, it's basically about his he, finding out he was Jewish and that, that some of his ancestors, um, you know, recent, recent relatives, had, had had collected this very beautiful pottery. Um, and now he's re written um, a, a, like a book, which is a correspondence between, imaginary correspondence between one of his ancestors and one of his collectors. Mm -hmm. So I think that the letter idea has kind of been around for a long time, but I, I don't know about the email thing. Maybe it will. I yeah. don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, Lisa's wondering if you recommend to um, writers that they do thorough research of the settings of their books. Oh, look, absolutely. I can't stress enough. Look, I've taught creative writing. I used okay. to teach at RMIT. And I've also taught um, private workshops on and off throughout the years because um, I don't know whether uh, uh, other of your readers or listeners or, or um, apprentice writers know that, you know, for every Trent Dalton, and he is an absolutely lovely man and could not have happened to a nicer person, mm -hmm. but for every Trent, there's, there's someone like me who's generally had to support themselves over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, with other, other jobs yeah. or like teaching writing or whatever. So when I teach writing, I mean, one of the things you've absolutely got to do is even though it's fiction, um, and because I've, I've written both um, journalism and fiction, um, you know, the, 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 the idea is that the journalism's the truth mm -hmm. and that, that fiction is the made up bits. But actually, the more I was a journalist, the more I realised that the journalism is just the surface and Fiction is quite often our whole selves, how, how, what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's this wonderful quote from Edith Wharton. She says, writing for her is like, you've got the tapestry at the front, which is this beautiful, beautiful image of, of, of everything lovely and, and um, complimentary and the colours and the shapes. But if you turn it around, you've got all the knots and horrible things that, that is, is really like the, the knots of existence. Mm. And so you've got to get the knots of existence, even in fiction, very true. You, it's absolutely got to be right. Because if you get anything wrong in your fiction um, about place in particular, 
readers are going to suspend their disbelief. Mm -hmm. And readers really need to believe that this is true. You know, like that's the main thing that you've got to get right. Um, you've absolutely got to research everything. It doesn't mean that you have to be there. I mean, I think it was Joyce who wrote, James Joyce who wrote a, um, a, a whole story set in South America or maybe even one of his longer pieces um, and he'd never even been, been there. You know, there's many, many examples mm -hmm. of writers writing about places they've never been, but you've really just got to make sure you get everything right. Um, for example, um, Chris in Schenectady in the book, um, the only reason I know anything at all about Schenectady is when I was very young in Greece for the first time, I met a Greek American from Schenectady. Oh, okay. Um, and she was telling me all these amazing stories about Schenectady used to be the where General Electric was, and it used oh, to be okay. called Electric City. Mm. It was a completely bustling, almost like a mini New York for many years at the turn mm. of the century and right into the first part of the 20th century. Um, and it had, you know, wonderful, um, a wonderful city centre and wonderful things about it. Um, a wonderful theatre, which I think still exists, a very Proctor's, Proctor's theatre. Um, uh, and she just drew this picture. She was a very um, imaginative person. She's still a friend now. And I just fell in love with this whole idea of Schenectady. Mm. And you'll find, if you go through my books, Schenectady features quite a lot. Yeah. Now, I've yeah. never been there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I've never been there. But mm. I'm, I had to do amazing amounts of research to actually get that right. I've been to upstate New York. I've been to New York. And I know I've driven upstate, but mm. I didn't go quite as far as Schenectady. So I was pretty confident um, that I'd got... Um, certainly cultural things right because I do know I know Tuffy really well and I've met her extended family so I know Greek Americans talk like that yeah. because at one stage the editor said oh she sounds a bit Jewish she sounds a bit like she's from mm. Brooklyn and I said mm. that's how they talk mm. they actually do talk like that so you've got to get those things right it's not just the place it's also um cultural things um accents um, mannerisms you've really got to get it right you know how if you're watching an Australia a movie where someone's doing an Australian accent and you know when they don't do it exactly yeah right. yeah I've also found that with audio books as well yeah yeah. Could, yeah that's really right yeah. well in fact <laughs> when when we did a test for the audio book for this one mm. um one of the readers uh read out um SUNY as S-U-N-Y now I know it's because and because I know that people from Buffalo and upstate New York call it SUNY. That's okay. SUNY. It's yeah. just referred to as SUNY. So that was mm. one thing I could correct her on. But mm. that's exactly right. Yeah. You've got to get yeah. that stuff right. Yeah, it needs to be authentic, doesn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, Mary's wondering who your biggest supporter is of your writing. Oh, that's a great question. Well, every every writer has their their friends that they write for, I, I reckon. And I'm really lucky. I've got two very old friends. Um, Emma has been my friend since we were 13 at Sir Dives High School. And, um, you know, we're still very good friends now. Um, she's a very early reader and a real supporter of my work. Mm -hmm. And Sandra, I met when I was a cadet journalist. Um, actually, I can mention her name because she's got her own book out and you should talk about she's mm -hmm. she's um called sandra hogan and she's okay. just written this wonderful book about um she she sort of um authored it but it's not her story it's a story about this family of spies in brisbane in the 1950s um that, and these children were made to spy for oh them. actually i wrote have read that and i did a review of it in our group it, great? it was a great book yeah it was amazing Oh, that really the children well, were, one of my yeah, oldest buddies. We've yeah. been friends since we were 17. Okay. And she's a great early reader of mine. Yeah. So you need people in your life like that. Mm. But I can also just say, if you're starting out as a, as, a, as a starting writer, one of the things that someone said to me, which I always followed, was when you're first starting out, you know, before you've been published, mm. say you're, you're, so you're a, you know, um, a trainee or an apprentice or a wannabe writer, Sometimes your friends and family are not the people to show your book to because, excuse me, until you actually 
um, born as a writer and, and published as a writer, which gives you a certain um, independence, so to speak, it's very hard for your friends and family to see you as a writer, and as, especially mm -hmm. if you're drawing from any material that might be shared. Mm -hmm. So I would just, uh, one of the things I do teach new writers is sometimes it's nice to have a completely independent voice read your stuff. Yeah, um, okay. The mm -hmm. other thing, the other person that's been, that who's been really supportive for me is my mother. Um, even though it was my dad who went to uni and my dad who was a journalist, and, and I'm sure I got my first journalism job, um, you know, because they knew my father was a journalist mm -hmm. back in the, in the late 70s. That's, you know, it was nepotism. And I suppose nepotism still is a thing now. But mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about the Courier Mail in the late 70s. Um, but... I, I I did have like like Dad was the one who was supposed to be you know the reader and the sort of the one with the with the sort of so called literary knowledge, but Mum's the reader and Mum's been really supportive. Mm, um, that's great. You know, she, yeah. and she and it's been hard sometimes because yeah. I have written about um, events that are inspired by our family life, mm. um, and that's kind of tricky to be the family of a writer. You know, because writers do use um, everything ar ar around them. It doesn't mean that you, you know, literally put everything down like yeah. a like a diary. Mm. But you do definitely use things, mm. you know, from mm. your from your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, Shirley says that you went to Greece to write this novel. What motivated you to do that, and how was the writing experience there? I'm thinking of Charmaine Clift and her writing. Life on Mykonos. Absolutely. And I was just talking about it too, Shirley. I don't know if you mm. heard me say that, but um, look, absolutely. I, I knew when I left my paid employment that, um, it, you know, it's really hard for a low-income person in Australia to, to survive. I yeah. mean, I'm sure there's, you know, many of you who, I don't know whether you know it personally or whether you, you've got friends and family, mm. but, you know, you need quite a bit of money um, to survive in Australia. So what I was looking at was ways, and this is actually why Charmaine Clift and George Johnson left London as well, by the way. We're talking about the 1950s. Mm. Nothing has changed. You know, we're, we're talking about 2019. Mm. And I could say that it was, it, it's cheaper for an Australian novelist like me on a fairly mod, modest income to live in Greece than yeah. it was in, in a, it, that it is in Australia. Um, so I... Luckily, I, I, I sort of knew Kithara pretty well. Um, I know a lot of people. I, we originally got a place um, through Airbnb because we wanted to get a long-term rental. Um, but, the, but when I was there, I realised that um, we were paying much more than we should have been. Okay. And in fact, we could get much cheaper accommodation just through word of mouth on the uh, island and pay island yeah. rates. Mm. So that's what we did. Um, so unquestionably, it's cheaper, um, and in many ways, it's an easier life because, um, well, sometimes I think Australians, you know, you've just got to see how much sports coverage there is in Australia as opposed to arts coverage. I look, I don't mm. want to say, um, you know, as Australians don't appreciate um, art and, and artists and writers and reading and music and everything because obviously we're doing this and there's lots of people out there yeah but you can just see from you know the, the whole debate about what happened to the arts during COVID mm. um, that it's, it is hard in, in Australia to, to, to even to say you're a writer in lots of ways people still think you're a bit of a wanker or you you know you're a bit of a poser mm. or something mm -hmm. um, whereas in Greece they love their writers, you know, they really love their writers and it means mm. something and they love their singers and, you know, it's, it's really lovely the way that um, a lot and lots of Greeks know, they know uh, their, their classic literature off by heart, they know their um, Ovid, they know their, um, you know, they, 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 they know their literature much more than Australians know their literature. Yeah. You know, yeah, and that, that's, that's a lovely thing to be in a in a culture and a country that that really knows their stuff. I mean, I reckon you could ask practically any ten year old great Greek kid, 
to say what, what's the story of um, Odessa's, um, you know, what's the journey that Odessa is, is on? And they'll, they'll tell you, 10 year olds. Mm. Well, you know, mm. like I reckon you'd be hard pressed to find 10 year olds in Australia to know about um, the poetry of um, Kath Walker, Ujuru, you know, wonderful poetry of Kath Walker, mm. or, um, you know, many, many Australian writers. Um, Who've, who've written beautiful things um like even you know uh, um, a, fr a friend of mine was saying the other day she had lunch with a 32 year old who hadn't who works in the arts who hadn't even heard of helen garner mm -hmm. not even heard of her mm -hmm. so you know i think that there'd be lots of australians who also don't know about patrick white mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah no that's really interesting and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Kelly is wondering, and this is something that I've been wondering as well, what sort of books do you like reading? And maybe if there's anything you've read lately that you'd like to recommend to us? Look, I, I really love reading um, the kinds of books that uh, kind of look, look at, at the whole question of what it means to be alive in some way. Now, I know most books do that. I do, I, I do know that, that ultimately, if, you, if, you, if you're writing any sort of fiction, it's looking at, you know, what it means to, to be on this little part of your, of the journey of human existence, you know, and we're such a small part. And, you know, that's what any writer does. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I really like books that question that. So I'm a huge fan of Rachel Cusk. Um, I'm a huge fan of Sigrid Nanez, who I've only um, read quite recently, and Charlotte Wood. I think she's really good. And I've actually just read Emily Maguire's uh, Love Objects, which okay. I think is a really lovely book. And mm -hmm. I heard her speaking at Avid Reader the other night, and she was talking about there's not much in Australian fiction um, where working class lives are depicted. You know, so she's she's really good on honouring sort of ordinary Australians. And that's why I think as well, Trent um, does so brilliantly yeah. as well, because I think there's a whole lot of ordinary Australian people's lives that don't mm. get written about. Um, mm. And I'm really interested in that because I've got an ordinary Australian family. And, mm. you know, one of my books is called um, uh, Life in Seven Mistakes. And that's really about, you know, a family, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of progression of one Australian family, um, which, you know, probably mirrors my family's experiences where they they started off in Cabramatta in western um Sydney before it was um before the Vietnamese were there but when it was mm. you know Greeks Italians and white white Australians who couldn't really afford um you know uh to live anywhere else you know the, the, so there was um so mum and dad had their first house at Cabramatta. Um, Dad went into the city every day to work, drove in, can you imagine? Mm. Like, you know, probably four mm. hours a day commuting. Mm. Um, and then they made good and they bu built their three little three bedroom house at St. Ives. You know, when okay, St. Ives yeah. was just a, yeah. a new suburb, when mm. I was growing up there, it was all a building site. You know, it wasn't what it, what it is now. Mm. It was where mainly working class people who had made enough money to go out into the, you know, far reaches of Sydney, mm -hmm. um, who, who to set up their, their lives. And, you know, all my family were working class from inner city Sydney. And, you know, they were all horrified when I started to move back to Glebe and Annadale and <laughs> all that sort of, you know, we left there, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think Emily's book is a really, really wonderful study um, of, of the dispossessed Australians in many ways, that, that and especially in Sydney now, that real estate mm -hmm. is just ridiculous yeah. and yeah. obscene. Mm -hmm. um, so she she looks at that. She also investigates um, what some people would call hoarding disorder in a really beautiful way. Um, you know, because all the all the things that that that, that the character um, collects uh, mean something to her. They're objects of of love to her. Um, and then it also has a very uh, a rich other thread about, um, you know, the, the, the sexual exploitation of a young woman, which is completely in the, 
in the atmosphere at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I would really recommend that book. And the other one I really liked was Meg Mason's um, Sorrow and Bliss that I think everybody... Yeah, knew. I've heard good things about that yeah. one as well. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I thought, like, her, it's, it's set in London, actually, but it's, it's mm. and, and Oxford, but it's very witty and, and, and really good. Mm. Um, so they're the things that I've been reading at the moment. Oh, and also I did read um, Late to the Party, um, uh, Trent's new book, which I thought was really, really terrific. Yeah, I mean, I've had a few people recommend that one as well. Yeah, He's like a Have Dickens, it. Australian mm. Dickens, you know, all these characters and, you know, he's it's really ro rollicking. It just mm. goes along and there's, um, you know, lo lots of characters like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark in some way. It's sort of like an adventure <laughs> yarn. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the other thing, I want to read Nikki Jemmel's book too. I haven't read it yet, but but apparently that's brilliant. It's called mm. The Ripping Tree. Okay, yeah. Well, thanks for those recommendations. There were some good ones in there. Um, Cassie's wondering if you prefer to write fiction or non-fiction. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I think I probably prefer to write fiction because, you know, it just mm. it does free you up to, to go anywhere you like mm. and you end up often in, in unexpected places. Um, but I do enjoy nonfiction. I wrote a, a little essay book. Um, do you remember a couple of years ago, Melbourne University Press did this on series. They got David Maloof wrote On Imagination, Germaine Greer wrote On Rage. Okay. I wrote one on beauty. Mm. And um, I really enjoyed that. And also the memoir is going to be interesting because it gives me a chance. That's what I'll be I'm doing next after all the mm. book publicity is over. Mm. Um, it really will give me a chance to write about not just mum and me going to to Kithra, which, which you know, in one ways could be like a Shirley Valentine sort of thing, except yeah. that, you know, mum was 85 <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm an old boiler myself too. <laughs> so it wasn't, <laughs> I mean, romance was kind of off the menu. Although there are some funny stories, I must say, okay. because <laughs> I did go to a dance where this French guy rushed up, it was like Cinderella, um, and and um, and sort of asked me out, and I hadn't seen him all night, so God knows where he came from. <laughs> um, and Mum was saying, why, "Why why would you go out with him? That you don't you know it's with someone you don't even know." And I said, "Well, that's usually how you meet people. I'm going to meet him for a coffee. I'm not going to go and you know marry him or anything." Yeah. Um, so there will be some amusing parts, but it also gives me a chance to write about the island itself because mm -hmm. it's fascinating. It was where. The Elgin Marbles were lost off the island. Uh, it just sunk off, off okay. Kithra. Um, Edward Lear, who wrote The Owl and the Pussycat, mm. he, he, he was on the island for a while. Um, there's this guy who is a direct descendant of Gustave Eiffel, and he is involved in this Manon de Source fight about doing up this, this old... Um, it used to be a quarantine station, actually. Mm -hmm. Venetian, though, like mm -hmm. 16th century, mm -hmm. um, because the, the, the local government wanted to get it back from him. So, uh, you know, I interviewed him. So there's all these fascinating stories. Yeah, plus sounds Plus a really physically beautiful place. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, Cassie uh, has said about the cover of your book. I'll just show people the cover again so they can see it. Um, she said that it's very colourful and bold and she wonders how it was chosen and if you had any choice in it. That is really interesting because, you know, covers are such a thing. Mm. Um, I can't tell you how many of my books have had naked w women of some description on them. <laughs> okay. I don't know why. People sort of think it's something to do with them thinking it's it's confessional and naked or something like that. Um, but that cover... Okay, so we did have some trouble with the landing cover mm -hmm. because um, even though I like it, it's a really beautiful image, it really misled, that was my last book, sorry, the landing came out in 2015. Okay. Yeah, um, by Alan and Unwin as well. Mm -hmm. But many people thought it was the wrong cover for the book, that it sort of pitched it to the wrong audience or something it just it's a really beautiful cover but mm. we really wanted to get this cover right um and so sandy cull is the designer she's an award-winning designer okay. she she does a lot of work for alan and unwin mm. 
so and she reads all the books which is really unusual you know really unusual so she was the one who first off just got it like that and she showed it to to annette and annette just went annette barlow my publisher went mm. oh my god this is beautiful and don't forget oh i forgot to say that this was actually should have been published in 2020 but it was delayed because oh, of COVID. Okay. So it was yep. absolutely before all the bright covers yeah, that you okay. see now. Mm. You know, like there weren't any bright covers yeah. at the time when she presented this to us in 2020. Mm. And as soon as I saw it, I went, oh my God, I think that's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Really, really beautiful. Yeah, so it's it really stand out. only, and, and we just loved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, and it's really, stand the bright colours, I totally agree, really stands yeah. out. Yeah. And that you said this has been released during COVID and that. How have you found pro promotion of the book? Well, it's been funny because normally I would do an East Coast book tour. Normally mm. I do Sydney, Melbourne, and I, we were even talking about driving down this time. My agent, um, uh, uh, Benithan Oldfield, was talking about driving down with me, we do a road trip and go to a few bookstores along the coast yeah. and then go, you know, Sydney, Melbourne. Um, but of course, you know, now no one wants to risk it really um, because you might get stuck. Yeah. I am going to the Sydney Writers' Festival. I'm doing an event uh, with Heather Rose, who's also a wonderful writer. And in fact, I've got her Bruni um, to read now. That's another one that, that I would really love to Museum of Modern Love. Mm. Um, so I'm doing an event with her on Sunday the 29th in Sydney. Okay. Um, and then I'll go and do a few book signings as well. And then I, I, I think I'll be on the program for Byron Bay and Melbourne Writers' Festival. I'm doing the Yarra Writers' Festival. Mm. Um, but COVID really has changed things. Yeah. I mean, I've done a couple of live events here in Brisbane. Um, I did one, I've done one at Riverbend and one at Avid Reader, and I'm doing one next week at Brisbane Square Library. Um, but it means that things have changed pretty, pretty radically, really. You know, you're just not getting out and meeting readers in, in, in the same way that you w were before, yeah. which is a shame, I think. Yeah, yeah. And have you been doing a lot of zones like this, though? I have. Um, I did. I've done readings. I've done a couple of other um, Zoom events. I've done podcasts as well. Okay. Um, uh, I had one that was cancelled the other day, though, because it was in Western Australia and um, it was a bookstore in Western Australia. And she said that people had just Zoomed out. I mean, I don't oh, know really? where you find that. Okay. No, I've still been finding we've had a lot of people joining. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, That's I haven't been, really been doing Zoom. Um, mm. You know, when I was in in Greece, I, well, I didn't have anything to, to be interviewed about really, but um, I, I haven't actually been doing that many things because events that I might want to go to in Australia, it was just the wrong time, Yeah, yeah. you know, so I really haven't done much myself until this, mm. this time. So mm. I have been doing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anne's wondering, well, she's wondering how many years you have in between or how long it takes you to write your book and how many years in between releases. Well, normally I'm the kind of writer, if you if you look at my backlist, I have a, a new book every three years. Okay. So I've pretty much had a new mm. book every th three years since 1987. But then I had a bit of a gap when my kids were small and when I had a lot of, you know, health problems after I had, you know, the, 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 the fistula. Um, I had, a you know, a, a couple of years where I had... Um, a, a series of operations and I was pretty ill for a while. Mm. Uh, and then... The, when you consider that, that 2005 was my last book, that seems like quite a long time. Although this book probably would have been published in about 2000, and, well, it would have been 2020. Yeah. yeah. And even yeah, five years fun. is quite a long time for me. Yeah. Um, I did have a lot of other, other, you know, versions of it during mm. that time. Um, and I was also, but I was writing, I was working full time. And it just got really caught up with me, I think. I mean, it's just too hard. It was really hard. I mean, I did do it. I did I did do it. Mm. But normally, I'm much more prolific than I have been. Yeah. Um, and the answer to when I finish one book and when I finish another is you, normally I have about a year. Um, you know, I do all the, all the 
the book promotion stuff. Um, I do mm. all the getting rid. It's almost like you've got to get one book out of your system before you can start another one. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm well and truly now uh, ready to start the, the memoir. And I have got about 10,000 words written. Okay. Um, it's got a working title, Sea, sea and Stone, A Mother, A Daughter and a Greek Island. But I'm not sure if I'll change that or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'll certainly, you know, I mean, I, I hope that I can, well, it depends. I mean, I've applied for various fundings and it just sort of depends whether I've got to go back to work and do, you know, write it part time yeah. or whether I can write it full time or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, getting back to economics, um, uh, you know, a lot of people think that writers, you know, who've had as many books as I have are sort of, you know, um, up the pointy end of the, the plane, you know, drinking champagne, and smoking <laughs> cigars and yeah. going around in, in Rolls Royces. But, you know, the, the truth is I'll probably will have to get some sort of paid employment. Yeah. Um, you know, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so do you think we might be out in 2023 or? Yeah, memory? probably even earlier. If I can okay. get it out, it'll be probably 2022, maybe. Yeah. If I can, okay. if I can finish it, twenty twenty two. If not, if I'm if I'm working more, maybe then twenty twenty three. But um, I know, you know, it's it's kind of weird as well because when I started, the, you know, when we started off on on our great adventure, COVID hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. So is it going to look really self indulgent and really, you know, uh, you know, middle class and wanky that you know you, you suddenly take me off with your mother, you know, to another, you know what I mean, like. Mm -hmm. Mm. you've got to read the room to a certain extent yeah. and while there's all these <laughs> poor people stranded over the other side of the world that can't get home mm. plus you know we know about the people you know like the, the, that poor family in Bill, you know the, from Biloela who are stuck on Christmas Island they won't let them in mm. um you know you've really got to watch that you know to check your privilege you know what I mean mm. so it's going to be interesting in mm. terms of even, even writing it really because um you know, even though we know the story of the world is one of migration, everyone has come from somewhere else, pretty much. Even Greeks that, that you know, we think they're, they're centuries and centuries old culture, you know, they're, they're often, you know, they're made up of Turkish and, uh, you know, Venetian, all sorts of different um, people that have passed through through Greece over the centuries. Yeah. Um, there's no such thing as, you know... A pure Greek or a pure, you know, like you know, you do, like it's 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 a mythology that 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 you know, mm. taken to its nth degree, the Germans followed in a very awful way. But the world is made up of people who, throughout time, have moved from one place to another. Mm. Um, so, in the sense, you know, many Catherians ended up moving to Australia, mm. and I was an Australian who ended up moving to Kithra. So, I'm I'm sort of trying to look at it from that point of view that that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, I've got to give myself permission to write it because you don't want to seem like this great big fat <laughs> wanker. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah. you've got to, these things are important. You've really got to be aware of, of your surroundings and, and, and what the world, yeah. what, the, what is the position of the world, mm -hmm. you know, that you're writing in. Yeah, yeah. And you said that um, your mother went back before COVID and that. So is the book really only about when you and your mother were there or does it go further when you were stuck there? And No, well, I, well, I haven't got to that bit yet, so I'm not yeah. quite sure. But mm. I think it will it'll, well, it'll go back to my time when I was there when I was, like, young, mm. when I was, well, twice when I was young. Once, the first time when I was about 18 okay. and the second time when I was about 21. Um, so it will go back to look at that period, but it'll also, um, you know, it will go a bit, because I've already written an intro in which I've already addressed the COVID stuff because I started okay. writing it when I was stuck in, yeah. in London. Yeah. So I don't really know what the answer is yet because um, mm. I haven't finished writing it. So, you know, it's going to be really tricky in, in a way to write because who knows what's going to happen. I mean, mm. are we still going to be stuck, you know, not being able to get in and out, you know, in, in two years' time? Mm -hmm. I mean... Like, look, with the vaccine rollout, it looks like until everyone's vaccinated, it's going to be really tricky to open up or yeah. let people in. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've got, I've got friends, I've got a really dear friend who's in Australia at the moment from France visiting her sister. And, 
you know, she, she's lived in France for 30 years. She's Australian, but she's lived in France for 30 years. And, you know, it's really hard for her to, to think of even going back um, because, you know, when will she see her sister anymore? Like, you know, the parents are dead. She's mm -hmm. got no, her, her sister's her only living relative, really. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, these, these are very painful things for everybody. Yeah. You just don't want yeah. to be so cavalier as to, mm. you know, just write this. So, I don't know. It's got to be, you know, a tricky thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. And could you tell people watching how they can keep up to date with um, what you're doing and places you're at for book signings? and? Yeah, well, look, I've, I've actually just gone back on social media. Okay. I went off last year. So now I'm back on Facebook. And I'm back on Instagram. Um, I'm on Instagram as SJ Readers. And I think you can find me on, you know, like, oh, the other thing is I'm, Susan Johnson is a really common name. Yeah. Anywhere I've yeah. lived, whenever I go to the doctor or the <laughs> dentist, they say, oh, which, which one are you? Yeah. And there's also a Susan Johnson who's a very successful, best-selling um, New York Times writer. And, oh, and okay. somehow her, her profile has been sort of, mixed in with mine mm. um but if you google me on facebook you should be able to find um susan johnson australian author i think um and i'll try and keep everything updated because i haven't been doing it up till now i'm also mm. on twitter um as well but you know like this is kind of like an extra job that writers need now yeah you know? with all the th yeah 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 mm. i mean some writer friends of mine aren't on it like um but most of them are now yeah. um you kind of need to in a way um but yeah so i'll try and and i've also got a website that i that i've just updated but i'm not sure that i know how to put events on it yet but i'll try and do it <laughs> yeah you need a you need a personal assistant yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Well, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great chatting with you today. Um, and thanks everyone who's joined in and we've had some great questions. Thank you so much, Jackie. And yeah, thank you for the questions. They've been really great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And maybe we'll be able to have you back again another time. Would be great no, I'd to love have you it. Back. I'd love it. So when the, yeah. the memoir finally comes out, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks and bye everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.